Hey everybody, give people a second to join. I have a moderator today. Rhett is behind the camera here. Hello. So you guys can ask questions and Rhett will relay them to me. Because I can't see them when they <laughs> when they come up. I'm Rick Beato, in case you guys don't know. That's Aiden Essen playing there, in case you guys don't know. Everybody asked me that, so I'll get that out of the way at the beginning. That's an improvisation that he did a couple years ago when he was here in Atlanta. Anyways, got a bunch of announcements to make. Um, one of which is that I have a podcast that you may or may not know about. And I released my first individual uh, personalized podcast on there with an interview with Scott Henderson that came out this past week. So if you go to the Apple Store or go to the Google Play Store and probably other places, Rhett, are they? Uh, right now it's just uh, the Apple Podcast app and Google Play, but we'll be looking to expand in some other arenas pretty soon just look up rick beato it's under rick beato everything music and there are the there are not only the sounding off series but there are other videos from lessons discussions things like that that are up there right now i think i have about eight podcasts but i'm going to be producing more original content for that as we move along here so um so keep checking that for updates but sign up for notifications for that i think is that, is that yeah right? yeah you'll just subscribe and uh, it'll show up in whatever podcast player you have yeah cool uh next thing is the i'm thinking about doing a workshop i talked about it a couple weeks ago and have made some headway on one of them but i i this was just a an idea to throw out there and I'd really like to get your opinion on it. Now, when you write opinions here in the comments section, Rhett is going to be reading them, but also I'd like to have you put your, your comments in after the video is over because the comments do not stay. And I'd like to know one thing, um, what you would like me to talk about. I thought about doing a one or two day workshop I talked about doing one in LA, one in New York, and one in London. Now, um, one of my uh, friends, Frank, who's been helping me with the London one, organized that and look into that, strategize for how to do that. We're kind of, we've made a lot of headway on that. But I thought of the first thing I'd probably do is do one right here in Georgia, in Atlanta. And I'm curious how many of you would come here to for it. How many of you live in this area or would come here? Uh, thinking about doing it sometime in the in the summer, maybe in July, late July. Um, but I'd love to get your suggestions on whether you think it should be one or two days. And what do you think I should talk about? Because I have a lot of different things to talk about. As you might know, uh, some of the things that we can't do necessarily on here uh, like play music, I can do at a workshop where I can actually play recordings and talk about them without getting uh, turned in by YouTube. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's a big advantage that we can do. Also, it would be great to meet some of you in person. Um, so I'm looking into some places. Uh, I thought about New York, LA. I know there's a big subscriber base there, but there is in Florida and Georgia and Texas as well. Um, I know there's people all over the world, but I'm trying to think of the most uh, logical places to do it where we can get the most people involved. So let me know about that in your comments, what your, what your opinions are. And if you would come, if I did one here in, in Atlanta, how many of you would actually sign up and come? So that's, an, that's another thing. Also, those of you that are watching this that haven't subscribed to, to my channel here, it'd be great if you did. I've hit, I think, 81,000 subscribers now. I don't like to talk about stuff like that. I don't like to go over these milestones or anything, but 100,000 is a big, big number out there looming that I'd like to get to here in the next, I don't know, six weeks or so if possible. That's gonna enable me to get some really big, as if I haven't had some big name people on, the, on signing off, but 
some people that you wouldn't expect I can get if I start if I can get up to that number. So tell your friends about it. Subscribe and also hit the notification button because the notification button will notify you when I'm coming on and doing these uh, YouTube lives like this. So that's really important. Um, let's see here. If you guys have questions anytime during this or at the end, Rhett is moderating them so he can actually read them. Feel free to throw your questions in. Rhett, you can interrupt anytime you want. Will do. And uh, tell me what people are saying. Um, this is called Practice Like a Pro. How do pros practice? Well, when I interviewed Scott Henderson, I asked him how much he practiced. And I do, I ask a lot of the people that I interview how much they practice. Now, there's a difference between practicing and playing. Um, but your practicing should be like you're playing. Practicing, though, is something that you do to try to incorporate new ideas into your vocabulary. And there's a great YouTube video of Michael Brecker talking about how he practiced. And he talked about the delay between what you're practicing and how long it takes to show up in your playing. And he says that there, for him, there was always a couple month lag. He would practice lines, ideas, whatever it might be, sub changes. And he would try and incorporate them, but he couldn't incor incorporate them right away. It took time to do that. The other thing that, uh, oh, so Scott Henderson, getting back to him, he told me he practiced 12 hours a day. Well, I know that Pat Metheny practices before each gig three hours, just before he goes on stage to play for two hours. Uh, I'm gonna have Pat on sounding off here next month, and I'm gonna ask Pat about his practice routine. I'm really curious about it, um, if it stayed consistent over the years, and uh, and what kinds of things he's practicing, or if he's if he's ever changed his routine. I've seen him practice before because I've I've snuck into gigs early before they were doing sound check and saw Pat practice on stage. So I always kind of had an idea. This is 30 years ago. 35 years ago. So I just kind of had an idea what he practiced. Um, and I thought about practicing a lot from watching him practice. And a lot of times he would practice over chord changes. He would practice a lot of arpeggios. He'd practice intervals. But he'd play ideas mainly. And not just run scales. Although he would do some scale exercises to warm up his hands. And there, for those of you that are a little bit older, like me, you want to do those kind of things to warm up and get your fingers loose. I've talked about this in the past that one of the exercises I do to warm up is the chromatic scale in thirds. What that in in entails is to play, if you're gonna play a scale in thirds, a chromatic scale, let's say I'm decent anyway. This is an easy way to visualize it in here. That would be a chromatic scale in thirds, but if you were to play Now you have to account for the string position, the different tuning between the G and B string, um, and to figure out where the shifting is. But this is a good one because it actually, you can use parts of these lines in your solos. You can also, um, it will also help you limber up your fingers. So I will typically start somewhere here in the middle of the guitar on my pinky and I'll go that's as far as you can go without shifting strings. And you want to get that half step there. Okay, that's going to open up your hand and start getting it, getting your uh, stretching going. So now, right there, that half step between these two strings is the only place that there's not a a wider jump like there is there. All the rest of them are big uh, five fret space interval reaches. So, a lot of times I'll start and end on the same note. If the transition is tricky, practice over the transition always. You always want to practice things beyond. You don't want to ever practice things that stop on the downbeat. Uh, you want to practice. You don't want to do that. You want to go. stop there and get that transition. Practice that a few times. Usually three times without a mistake is good. If you can go five times without a mistake, 
that's better. If you go eight times without a mistake, it's even better. That's when you know that it's ingrained. A particular pattern is ingrained in your playing. So that's a great warm up. Now, can you incorporate something like that in a, in a line? Um, if I did like a D minor chord. Okay, so there I did. So if I hit a D minor chord here. took an idea, a practice idea, and I made music with it. That's the whole idea of practicing, is actually making music with things. Um, a lot of people will practice their scales in all different interval combinations, which is great. Because when you get, when you have an idea and you want to execute it, you need to be able to actually execute it, what you're hearing. Because that, that's the whole thing about playing what you hear, is that there's a certain amount of technique involved there. And that technique is related to what you have under your fingers and if you can actually pull these things out accurately and play all the right notes. So if I were to play my scales in sixth, for example, now let's say I'm going to play an A Dorian scale. And when I say in sixth, I'm going to go one sixth. I'm going to do sixth like that. So I'll take an A minor chord. Uh, okay, that's cool. But am I going to use that in a line? Um, I might use it like this. scale in thirds is really boring unless you use little fragments of it right so if I'm doing a Dorian again so I'm thinking G major here so I'm so the first thing you have to do you gotta know where those notes are right so one of the ideas to throw out there so it's easy to say oh play your scale in thirds well you got to know where all the notes are available across the neck which does involve in actually playing scales so the first thing I like to do uh, when, I, when I was first beginning to play is to cover the neck in all my major and minor scales, which essentially means what I would do is I, I wouldn't necessarily play up each mode. I would take positions on the guitar, or if you're on the, on the keyboard, uh, it would be a similar thing. On the keyboard, you've got a particular fingering that you would have. If you're doing C major, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. A lot of groupings on piano on major scales will have that grouping. F major is a little different. It's one, two, three, four, one, two, three. F, G, A, B flat with a fourth finger. You always, on the piano, you always play the black keys with these three fingers. We call it the second, third, and fourth fingers because they're your long fingers. So you try to keep those on the black notes. You can play thumbs on the black notes for certain things, obviously, you have to, but most scales, if you want to know what the correct fingering is, if you, if you follow that rule, diminished scales are different because sometimes you're going to get a lot of one, one twos. Uh, chromatic scale is a little different because chromatic scale on the piano is one, three, one, three, one, three, one, two, one, two, three when you have white notes. So on, on B, C, and on E, F, you go one, two, but all the rest are one, three. So that's kind of a different combination. But on the guitar, what you want to do is you want to, like I said, cover the neck. So if I'm thinking in G major, 
I'm going to play this first position here, which would be G Ionia. I call that at the note fingering. At the note fingering means that I'm, it's in the middle of my hand, so I'm starting with my second finger. You can do below the note and above the note fingerings. On G it would be hard to do below the note. Below the note would be, would be that. That's below the note, meaning I'm starting with my, with my ring finger and my pinky. Above the note would be one. Above the note you start getting into bigger hand stretches. But what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to cover the neck and you need to be able to do all fingering combinations. So, if I were to do the first positional playing in G major, I usually will play a chord. So I'm going to play an A Dorian sound because I like to play it. I want to hear it against something else. So a G major scale over an A minor 11 chord is gives me an A Dorian sound. So I'll start here. I go to the all the available notes I have. I'll start in F sharp actually. So I cover the neck. on the descent, okay? I came down a different way that time. I came down in an open position. The first time I came down in a closed position. Then I'm going to go up to here to beat Phrygian. position, meaning usually a four fret spacing. And then I'm not going to bother with C Lydian here because it's all the same pattern. I'm going to move up here where a D mix Lydian would be. start incorporating these things, seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, sevenths, interval combinations. But you always want to keep in mind that you're trying to play music with these, okay? So what would seconds be? Seconds would be... You can do fourths like that. It's not as clean. You want to always try and do try to do your fourths without bars if you can. The, the index finger is the only finger I like to bar with if I'm going to. If you notice Alan Holdsworth when he's doing his chord forms, never plays bars except with the index finger. Really doesn't. Any of his chord shapes he does, check it out. He, he rarely will play a bar, only with the index finger. Uh, every note's fingered, that way they have even pressure and you get a nice even sound on it. So <clears throat> anyway, so then you move on to fifths. Now I do, I, I play fifths, you guys, hear, you guys hear me play fifths all the time, but compound fifths, so you go one, five, nine. Really cool. 
is really great sounds. You start hearing those against. things, your sixth, your seventh on your fingers, then try to incorporate them into melodies. Try to play them over chord progressions. So if I'm thinking, if I'm practicing A Dorian, I'm going to play A Dorian to D something, the D Mixolydian, D Mix Sharp 11, and then I'm going to go to G Ionian. I'm going to try and make up lines that make sense. So let's say I take seconds, okay, and I play a line like this. <clears throat> I didn't do them consecutively. What did I do? I started on the root and I go. So. There's my D7 chord. Now I'm on my G major there. I did D7. So that's an idea based off seconds. Make it musical. Same thing with arpeggios. Let's talk about arpeggios a little bit. So with your scales, scales you simply just have intervals to practice in them. You can do, you can play things. Or. So I'm doing a descending pattern. Down to B here, I, I octave displace it. Also, I got those drums of the seventh. So check it out. It makes it more musical instead of playing the scale straight. Arpeggios. Well, if you're going to play arpeggios, don't simply just run up and down the arpeggios because there's no music in that. You want to try and use them musically. So let's say I'm going to play, and uh, let's say I'm doing this A minor chord again. I'm doing A minor because it's easy to play here. I don't have to play any black keys on the, on the keyboard. So, well, I can play an A minor 7 arpeggio. That sounds cool. I can play a C major 7th arpeggio. That sounds a little bit cooler even. I can play A minor add 9. I can play uh, E minor 7. Nice sound, right? I can play A minor 7. set of three strings, A minor 7, G major 7, D7. Cool, right? So what did I do there? I made an odd note grouping. It's much more interesting to do your arpeggios Take them in little bits. Take them on three strings. So I'm playing here. Or. Right? But I did descending, right? I'm using all G major. But I'm going, I'm displacing it like a...
Five note groupings sound good because they don't hit on the same beat. Anytime you do odd groupings, any of your great guitar players that I've interviewed, Steve Vai, John Petrucci, or that I'm going to, Marty Friedman, people like that, they all play odd note groupings. They do them in the pentatonic scale, they do them in the, in, in the major scales, the harmonic minor scales, whatever it may be, but they do a lot of odd note groupings. Right there is a way to play your arpeggios in odd note groupings. ideas. So I combine the sixth along with it. Then I can do my pentatonic, same thing. I can do those in odd note groupings. Take your simple A minor pentatonic and do it in odd groupings. What do I mean? One, two, three, four, five. 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 That makes for a really It's really hard for me to do the straight uh, groupings like they would come in the scale, like because anytime I do a grouping like that, I'm only going to do it probably three times at the most, and I'm going to change the line. So I might go uh, like this. I went up to the next position of the pentatonic, this one, right, and I did. in there but I broke up the line so it's more interesting you want to do your practicing where you're not repeating the same ideas throughout the whole scale try and break up if you're gonna do fives do fives but do only a couple groups of fives and move on from there you should be able to do it <laughs> by not playing just straight eighth notes or sixteenth notes. Uh, so, working on the different arpeggios that are off, if I'm playing on an A minor chord, I'm gonna play the arpeggios on the root. I'm gonna play the arpeggio on the, off the third, the flat third, so off C, which is gonna be the major seventh arpeggio. I'm gonna do one off the fifth, which would be E minor seven. If, if you do that, and then I might do one here, minor major seven sound, uh, to get used to that other sound in case you have that, you know, beautiful minor major seven sound, right? Once again, I'm never stopping, I'm never uh, letting those ideas go where I'm just running up and down. And when you hear people that 
are just sweeping through arpeggios and stuff, just up and down, up and down, up and down. That gets really boring after a while. And you don't hear uh, your great players don't do that. They don't just go. They don't just go up and down, up and down, up and down because it, it's it's. Uh, um, I once heard Pat Metheny say, "Don't practice saying, practicing things like that is like polishing a water faucet. It doesn't make the water any purer." He said that in an interview in Guitar Player magazine, like in 1980. So it was something to that effect, and I was like, "Well, that's kind of an interesting idea." So don't just practice sweeping up and down these things. If you're going to sweep, then play, have it go. Actually, go into something. Use that sweep. So I did. Now that would be a cool sweep. I want A minor. arpeggios that aren't your standard run-of-the-mill. Try your sus4 arpeggios. They're a lot harder to play to sweep through them if you're going to do that. Okay, if I were to do that, so I'm doing a um, G sus4 arpeggio on an A minor chord. need to practice but this those sus4 arpeggios are are very hard to play practice those if you can play those that's the frank ambali stuff that that really makes his playing different than anyone else's because he can actually execute those things it's easy to sweep through major and minor arpeggios that is simple Try and sweep through sus4 arpeggios going up and up and down the neck. That, then you start getting into some really tough things. Um, but if you're going to sweep through them, sweep through it as you're leading somewhere, or you know whether you're leading up to a note. So if I'm playing, if I'm, let's say I want to go to that note. If I'm target note of D, that 11th, to get that minor 11 sound. Now that is actually, would have a point to having that arpeggio there. If you did um, a G major sound over that, right? So I swept the G major arpeggio.
Once again, that's a way to practice arpeggios. Take two of them out of the scale that are next to each other, that are a whole step apart, and just practice weaving between them. Don't just practice blah, 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 and moving up and down through it. That's, that's a waste of time. Practice things and make music out of it, okay? Practice your sweep arpeggios to go somewhere, to lead your, your melody into the next phrase. Go over the hump, okay? When you hear Alan Holdsworth play or Pat Metheny play, they're always playing over the bar line with these things. They're not, they're not playing an idea, stopping, play the next idea, stop. You don't want to be stopping on the downbeats. That's why you always want to practice into the next measure, okay? So if I'm going to play a line, I want to be thinking if I'm going to be going to, if I'm on a D7 chord, I want to be thinking D7 flat 9, okay? I play. Now, resolve like. I want to have a direction to my line. If I'm playing A minor 7 to D7, saw my video on playing over one chord I was doing things like add nine arpeggios Lydian major arpeggios um, uh, minor nine arpeggios and playing them over a static chord well once again when I was doing that I was improvising I know what the fingerings are for the things but I'm still playing them if I have a, a, a an A minor chord again I know that that I know that, that D major will work on that. But that's got a lot of the good notes on it, so I might start with D ma G major first. I start on C, but I play. seven arpeggio too so I was doing dominant seventh arpeggios as well um, and I did the um, example where I was playing over an E five chord and I did um, uh, I did like G major A major and nine and then So what did I combine in that whole idea? Man, I played sixth, I played, uh, I played dominant seventh arpeggio, but I was playing progressions. And I was just playing over an E5 chord, right? So it could be major and minor, it could be minor.
So we've had a few people ask different versions of the same question. Okay. Um, basically, how do you maximize your time practicing? A lot of people are saying they've only got 30 minutes to practice a day. Some people don't have 10 hours, 12 hours to practice a day. So what would you recommend for those people who may have a pretty tight schedule to nail some of these concepts down? I would, I would work on just one concept. Uh, I would do a quick warm up to get your hands limber. When you do warm ups, I would do different things every day. Don't pick the same warm up each day. Take one little fragment, say I'm gonna practice one position of, a, of an ad nine arpeggio, one position of a Lydian major arpeggio or Lydian arpeggio. Uh, practice that each day a new thing and keep a log. Okay, so you spend five minutes on that and the rest of the, the next 25 minutes, you need to practice. Um, your important things to improve as a player or to practice music. Play things that are idea centric. Play over chord progressions. If you have a gig coming up, work on a solo or transcribe. That's the other thing for practice. That that is that is kind of like an unsaid um, that's something that's un that that's, uh, that I just assume people are going to do if they have a little bit of time. If you hear something that you like and don't know how to play it, learn it. Unless it's Al Alan Holdsworth and you can't play it. Uh, but pretty much anybody else, most people can play the things if they practice enough. Um, what you don't want to do, don't practice what you know. Practice what you don't know. If you've played that scale, that pentatonic scale in fifth inner, in, uh, in groupings of fives, don't practice that. Once you can play it, move on to new ideas. Always be working on things that you don't know. Sometimes it takes a couple months to incorporate those ideas. Don't run up and down scales though, never do that. Only do fragments of things. If you're gonna play a scale, I, will, I mean, I'm not gonna run the scale. I'm not gonna do that. There's no point in doing that. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna combine two scales. So I combine A Dorian to D half diminished, uh, to D half whole diminished. So I. So I'm combining scales there. I'm practicing A Dorian descending, then I'm doing a transition. Then I'm, then I'm transitioning to the first available note on the next scale. That's a great exercise to practice, but take a concept and keep a journal. Okay, actually write it down. Don't type it anywhere. Write it down. You have your notebook of the things that you practice so you can always refer to it. Also, I used to have a cassette of ideas. Now you can keep them on your phone. Your phone, you should have, you should always label your ideas too and say like, um, uh, you know, G major add nine arpeggio over A minor 11 or uh, A major triad over D, D flat major or something or something, you know, like uh, you do like a po polygon, let's say you do A major over E flat and you're doing this. This kind of sound here that'd be like an E flat seven flat nine flat five sound. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing something like that and how to incorporate that. And I just came up with a line. I did a uh, B flat Dorian. say okay that log is going to be two five one in a flat major um, with and I'd write it down with a uh, a over E flat chord as my dominant chord because that's the thing I'm going to remember I could play a bunch of different ideas that lead into that note I'm, I'm going to go to that E E note What, 
that whatever you're doing. Then you record it and you keep it and you listen to it over the course of the week and trying to gradually incorporate these things into your playing. Writing out solos is also a good thing. Where you accompany yourself, you play. So I'm doing like a rhythm changes in A flat, for example. I don't know why I did rhythm changes in A flat, but uh, I'll record myself using my phone playing that, and then I'll start it over and I'll practice ideas over that. And it might be that I'm only playing blues ideas first, and then I'm playing one, six, two, five lines over it, and really outlining the changes. And then, um, and then maybe I'm playing the third time through, I'm gonna practice, or the third day, I'm gonna practice sub changes over a one, six, two, five, okay? This is why the Beato book is helpful, because you can go in there and pick a chapter out and say, oh, the one, six, two, five lines, I'm gonna take some of the lines out of here and incorporate some of these into my playing. Uh, Having an organized practice schedule is one of the hardest things to do, especially when you have a short period of time. Because typically, um, it takes about an hour to get a good practice session in. You don't need any more than an hour. If you can practice more than an hour, great. But um, to start incorporating new ideas, you got to try and put in at least an hour a day. I think that that's um, I think that's the minimum time. Also, you want to break up your practice sessions, too, so that you don't get uh, any type of repetitive stress uh, stuff, especially if you're working on keyboards all day. If you're typing at a computer, you got to be really careful. I do a lot of keyboard typing, but I always take breaks doing it. I always do stretching because I get it in the thumbs. That's where it hurts me. Um, uh, one of the things, too, because people notice as they get a little bit older that... Any of you that get, gets, get a pain in this part of your thumb, this is actually very common for people that use phones and the swiping like that, people that type with their, with their thumbs. Um, there's this overuse, I forget, uh, De, De, De Quell, uh, what is it called, De Quervain's uh, syndrome disorder. A lot of people will have surgery for this uh, tendon here because it gets really inflamed. But what the problem is, is that you actually, those muscles get weak from, and they, from opening the hand. So what you do, and I, I had this problem for three years, I was going to have surgery on it, and I saw a video, somebody told me about this, and I saw a video on it, and this chiropractor was showing, he had this glove that had a rubber band in it, and, he was, and so I put rubber bands in my hand, and I practiced opening my hands, it went away in one day. This is three years of pain, in one day of using some rubber bands and, do, and opening my hands against it made that pain go away, and also stretching the thumb. So... Anybody that's using your phones and everybody's using their phones and they're swiping constantly, especially on iPhones. Well, all, I think all phones, even mm -hmm. Androids, Rhett, don't they mm -hmm. do that too? Yeah, it's any smartphone any now. Any smartphones yeah. you swipe on with a thumb. And there's a lot of that, that disorder. And people get surgery for it. Un, they don't need the surgery. They need to stretch. And they need to strengthen their hand in opening. And this really affects the guitar. I had a point, I don't know, Rhett, if you remember this, where a few years ago where I was having trouble playing. Yeah, yeah. It hurts so much. Yep. I could barely play. I couldn't even play for, for two minutes because mm -hmm. my thumbs hurt so much. Both hands, I couldn't hold the pick. And in one day of watching this video, after three years, I went to see a specialist, I, and I was going to have the surgery. And somebody told me, check out this thing. I forget. Some, somebody told me to, to look it up, a doctor friend of mine, actually, who had the surgery. And I looked it up, and I found a video. I was like, I wonder if there's exercises to get rid of this. And, of course, I find some guy. Funny thing is, I found this guy that was talking about a chiropractor, he had a glove on that had rubber bands in it. He was showing how to open it. I remember I was going to sleep when I watched it. I just did it with one hand. I woke up the next day and this hand was killing me and this hand, it was gone. And it occurred to me, I was like, wait a minute. And I went through my history on my YouTube and I found that video. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. I did it with the other hand, gone. For, and, I, and it's been gone for years. It actually started hurting yesterday. I was going to get out the rubber band today, but... Uh, uh, so that's what, you know, when you get a little bit older and you're a guitar player, you got to keep those, uh, get, get that motion to open those fingers too. That's what keeps your speed up as well, is that, uh, to keep your dexterity. There's no reason that you should lose any technique. Even if you get to be 70 years old, 75, 80 years old, 85, you can keep your technique. I mean, I look at Martha Argridge, who's, who's uh, one of the greatest pianists. She's 75, almost 76. 
go watch your videos from from this year playing Chopin's uh, first piano concerto, playing Liszt. She's killing it. I mean, just playing the Scarlatti, this uh, sonata that's that has all this um, super fast trills on one note, uh, and. She plays it the same as she did in the 1960s. You can find her when she's in her 20s playing it. Same speed, same articulation, same clarity. Uh, other questions, Brett? All right, yeah, so we're, let's take some questions here. What we're looking for, just post your name and where you're from and your question, and we'll uh, moderate them. Somehow we started like a, a video game discussion in here. I don't know how that happened, but yeah, we're going to spend the next couple minutes taking some questions, guys. So give them a second to come in here. Guys and girls. The guitar is a Dan Electro, by the way. A bunch of people have been asking about that. Yeah, I've had it for a long time. I bought it for like two hundred dollars or something like that. But it sounds great. I don't know. It's a great slide guitar too. I'm not sure why it sounds so good. All right, so Zach, how do you practice phrasing with arpeggios and scales? Uh, any books I should check out from Chicago? Uh, I don't know any books that are in Chicago, but I know a book in Atlanta called the Beato Book. <laughs> that you can buy that will have ideas. I'm actually serious about that. Um, you don't need books to practice arpeggios, though. Um, if you need the chord shapes, they're in my book. I've got all the arpeggio shapes that you need to practice with the fingerings, the fingerings I like to use. Um, but once again, practice them as musical ideas. Don't just practice an arpeggio to practice it. Practice it in context of something. Play an idea with it. All right. Man, these are going by so fast. You can stop it, actually. Oh, really? Here. Yeah, and you scroll back. Let's see here. Mike from Woodstock, local guy. What are some good away from guitar stretching exercises? Um, what I do, I do a couple different ones. Um, I do this where I grab my thumb here and I and I will just give it a little bit of pressure like that and find the spot where it's really painful and just hold it there like that. And make sure you breathe while you're doing it. That's really important. So I always, because that's, that's one of my trouble spots. The other thing I do is with my hand out like this, my arm straight out, and I will, will, um, I will stretch my wrist, just, just lightly uh, pull your wrist down like that to, to, to do that. And then same thing on this way. This is typically where guitar players get a lot of problems is the, I'm pulling my hand back here like that. I have my arm out stretch, I'm pulling it back and just stretching those tendons. Be careful not to stretch too far or too fast, just gradual stretching, keep that pressure against it while you feel that pain and then release. And do that a few times. Try and do that during the day if you can, like a number of times. That'll keep you nice and limber. Yep. Chops up. Austin from Augusta, Georgia. I've been playing guitar for 10 plus years, taught myself. I'm not very good with music theory. Should I learn piano to help understand theory? Piano's good because it's laid out a lot easier than guitar is, but you can learn theory on guitar. Um, it's easier to visualize things like chords on the piano just because it's laid out, laid out left to right that way and you can look at it a lot easier. So. Um, I would never discourage anyone from learning the piano. You should always, everyone should have a basic, have, should have basic facility on the piano. All right. I just passed a decent one here. Let me see here. All right. So according to you, what are the most important skills to have as a musician? Rhythm, theory, knowledge, ear? All of those. <laughs> <laughs> nice. If you don't have good rhythm, that's, that's a problem. Uh, you know, there's no, there's nothing, I tell you this, people that have bad rhythm, I tell to jump rope. I, I'm serious. I would tell my college students, I would have college students that would have horrendously bad rhythm. And I'd say, you know what you need to do? You need to jump rope. And they say, what? And I say, yeah, I'm telling you, jump rope. That will improve your rhythm. Because the timing involved in it, the fact that your, your whole body's involved, it's a hard exercise, it's aerobic. Uh, it's not something on your on the guitar. Also, try different exercises. Uh, you know, try and um, buy yourself a drum pad and and learn some basic drum rudiments, some paradiddles, any type of drum rudiments to get your. Because typically, what happens with rhythm is that it's actually it's just physical coordination, 
and you're just not s synchronized or you don't have a good internal pulse. If that's the case, that's tough. Uh, that's a tough thing to, um, that's all spatial relationships though, the internal pulse, meaning can you keep, can you keep a steady beat? Um, to do that though, you have to think one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. I'm always subdividing when I'm thinking of stuff like that. That's how you, you, how you get a good internal pulse. Always be thinking like that. And I was snapping on two and four. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one. The more you have your body involved, the more body limbs involved in a rhythm, the more, um, the more together you're going to be with it. So. All right. Joe Hernandez from Miami wants you to demonstrate some altered dominant scale patterns. Joe Hernandez. Hey, Joe, how are you? Um, Okay, alter dominant scale patterns. Okay, so an alter dominant scale pattern, let's say, let's say I take an A altered scale here. So A alter dominant would be from the B flat melodic minor scale. So I've got this one fingering here that's at the note. I could go here. I move up to that position, you know. And if I do it here. practice the different arpeggios out of it. Right, so I'm doing that. So that's that B flat uh, melodic minor or minor major seventh arpeggio. But I did the couple different triads in it too. I might take, actually let me do it here. Um, so I've got sounds for you. E flat seven. Uh, C sharp. Uh, I'm going F major, E flat major, and then E flat at nine. That's a great sound. Sus four three. Take the arpeggios in the scale: B flat minor, uh, C minor, and then go through all the different D flat augmented and so on, E flat major, F major, and go through all the triads, go through all the seventh chords, and take out a couple different ones in there and practice between them. All right, Jason, how do you get better at accenting notes during improvised solos? I have a hard time getting that real articulated jazz sound during my solos that people like Wes Montgomery and Pat Metheny have. Um, that's a, actually a great question. A lot of it is the uh, where they, both those guys do a lot of slurs. Now they can, they can pick a lot of notes too, but there's a lot of slurring. It's, a lot of it's where, where you put pull-offs or slides in your scales. 
So the accent So if I'm doing I'm playing accents in there, so I'm doing that in or on the on the way out I'm doing a lot of pull-offs and hammer-ons so I'm trying to think if I'm say because I, I just I've been doing it for, for 40 years so I don't really think about those accents because um, sometimes I'll pick every note sometimes I'll do hammer-ons all the time uh, but I'm always really aware of where I want to put those things and sometimes it just takes a harder you know pull on the note to give you an accent or a harder pick on the note everybody's picking techniques different so it's really hard to say so Practice those groupings up. Practice those odd groupings and everything. That'll help you get the, get those accents, especially when you get accents on upbeats that you're not used to. All right. Isaac from Pueblo. Rick, do you who do you think are the best guitar players today? Oh, um... Boy, I don't want to really say because I don't want to offend anyone. I'm not. I'm not in in the. Uh, I'm not here to rate guitar players. There's so many great ones uh, that I don't want to uh, say. But I'll say this: you'll see a bunch of them on my channel on Sounding Off, ones that I really like. How's that? You've seen a few of them already. All right. Let's see. I'll take a couple more questions. It's great to have a moderator. You have any trolls here, Rip? Nope. See no that? trolls today. You got a moderator, you don't have trolls. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so demonstrate Sean seventy one says demonstrate and explain how he would practice two five one licks and take them through the cycle. Anything for building jazz vocabulary. Take them through the cycle. Um Okay, two five one licks. Uh well, you have to define it first if you're going to play one bar two five ones or two bar two five ones. One bar two five ones would be the two and the five chord in the same bar. Um, if you're doing one chord per bar, so you do, let's say, like I said, you know, like we've been doing A minor seven to D seven to G major seven, and I do one bar of A minor seven, one bar of D seven, one bar of G major seven. So, um, if you're practicing lines, most people start their lines ascending. I practice line, it doesn't matter. You should be able to, you should make an observation first whether you start your lines uh, ascending or descending. But I would just take simple ideas and play, you know. So I did. Um, one, two, one, two, three. So uh, try ideas that don't start on the downbeat. They can start. So I go. So I did one where I did. Uh, I did one to start after the downbeat. Or you can play into the chord. Um, uh, Always try to lead into things. That's how you want to develop these. Don't play licks that are just straight eighth notes. Always have rhythmic motifs. So, so I'm thinking.
All right, last one. Anthony Lane from the United Kingdom. Yep. Long time pop music, guitar and piano. Wanted to get into jazz, but don't know where to start. Any advice? Um, where to start? A good thing to start with is uh, listening to some jazz. I would start, if you're a guitar player, I'd start with some, you know, uh, people like Joe Pass that play standards. I think he's a, Joe is a great, great place to start. What you need to do is just get the sound of it in your ear. Um, and I would start by learning a couple solos, a couple really easy solos, maybe a couple solos on a blues. There's a, um, if you're a decent enough guitar player, there's, there's a tune called Fried Pies that is on a West Montgomery record called The Boss Guitar. That's a good, that would be a great solo to start with because it's a, it's not that difficult. It's got great rhythmic ideas. It's got great motifs. It's not too hard to play. Uh, except for the chord, there's one fast diminished chord run that's hard to play. Other than that, um, that would be a good thing. I would take some, some solos like that. Some of the Joe Pass solos are really hard to play because uh, there's a lot of fast stuff, but some of the West stuff is, is good. Even if you, you don't have to learn the whole solo, learn a couple choruses and start getting developing a vocabulary. It's like learning a language. You have to de develop a vocabulary of sounds. Blues is a good place to start with, though, a jazz blues. So anyways, I think that's going to conclude today. Remember, subscribe. If you guys haven't subscribed to my channel, hit the subscribe button now. Also, the Beato book, you can write me at rickbeato1 at gmail.com. I answer all my emails. I got no, com no computer program that does that. Anybody that wants my book has to write to me first. Um, also, let me know about the workshops. If you guys would come to Georgia, to Atlanta, to do one, I want to know who would come here. I'm working on updating my website, my rickbeato.com, which I haven't updated in about two years. I, it's been so long since I've updated that until this morning, I didn't have any YouTube videos on it. None. I didn't even have my YouTube channel on it, believe it or not. That's how long it's been. Uh, my podcast, Scott Henderson. Great interview with Scott. I did it uh, about two weeks ago or so, and I put it up last week. A bunch of people have downloaded it. Check it out. It's really, really good. And I've got... Uh, Rudy Sarzo coming up tomorrow. Anyways, that's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. And if you're interested in the Beato book, write me at rickbeato1.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching.